Well, good evening. And welcome to Worship of God. Preparation for worship comes from C.S. Lewis. Lewis wrote two books, thinking about grief and pain and emotional trouble. The first one was called The Problem of Pain. The second one was called A Grief Observed, and he wrote the second one after his wife died. So the first one he writes, just kind of thinking about it in general, and then the second one he writes after he's been through it, and the, they're both good, but the second one packs a lot more of a punch. And I believe it, and it's, it's in that one that he says, patience for people who say, there's no death, and death doesn't matter. So thinking about, well, there's going to be but he dies. I mean, because they're not really dead, right? And Lewis would say there is death. And they are irrevocable and irreversible. You might as well say that birth doesn't matter. Uh, the Lord so arranged it that on this resurrection day, we're thinking about Saul and the death of Saul and David's thoughts on it. And it's natural that on today, we, most of Easter lilies are already gone, but we think about people who have died. And with that, our, our call to worship, thinking the psalmist says, with my mouth I will greatly extol the Lord, and with a crowd of worshipers I will praise Him. Let's go to Him in prayer, asking that we would have hearts that praise Him, even in the midst of many sorrows. Father, as we think about the Easter lilies that have already been taken home, as we think about those that are up there, as we think about loved ones that we've already considered uh, or who are with you or Father who have passed on and had no faith, Father, we know that you are the Lord of life. We ask that as we worship you, you would be well pleased. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together to sing the first two verses of Abide With Me. Whatever has changed, thinking about the last two, three, four years of your life, this God who hasn't changed, he greets you with these words. May grace be yours, and may God's mercy be yours, and may his peace rest on you. And these come from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, and as God's greeted us, let's greet one another. read together from the Apostles' Creed and this for about 
1,700 years, so whatever you're going through, there's been somebody who said it before, and that helps. Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only God, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And please be seated. We don't have children and worship this evening, so we'll be taking prayer requests right now. Prayer requests and praises. Gerald. Indeed. Thankful the youth group made it back safe and sound. Both both of those are two, both of those are good. Jonathan. Indeed, Grandpa and Grandma could be here, and that the Lucink babies were born safe and sound. Sir. Thank God for our blankets. Um. Wendell. Yeah, we got the JFA bus tour. Nice. Where's the Where's it going? Is it? Okay, man. Well, to it's going to have to go through elsewhere to get there. I would imagine that'll be really good. So thank you. I'm going to get you from over here, Jacqueline. Yes. It was a joy to see. Was it 78.80 this week? Yes. Safe travels for people who've been traveling. Yeah, for grandpas and grandmas, too. <coughs> Jonathan. And today is the day Jesus rose. This, this is a good side of the sanctuary, too. I don't want you guys to feel left out over here. Well, let's go together to our God in prayer. And Father, we come before you because you make very clear that you care about what we care about. It doesn't mean you always agree with us, of course just like parents don't always agree with us when we share our thoughts. But Father, you do care. It's of concern to you what matters to us. And so Father, we lift before you 
our cares. And Father, we care about the, the youth of this congregation. We thank you that they're back safe and sound as well as their leaders. Father, it seems that good work was done and a good time was had and able to reconnect with, with friends. Father, we bless you for that. Thank you as well that on a day like today we're able to to shed spirit. Many of us spend it with family, with grandpas and grandmas and cousins and uncles and aunts. And Father, that's a tremendous gift. Thank you for other blessings that you you give us, Father. Various things that do comfort us. Other such such gifts, Father, that mean things to us. And whether we're four years old, Father, or 84, there are things that, that mean something, whether it's a photo we carry in our, our wallet, whether it's something we, we keep in our truck. Father, these remind us of, of loved ones and of, of love, and Father, we thank you for that. We thank you as well for tokens of your care that we see in, in sunshine. Father, we think about the, the psalm and how the, the sun, like a champion delighting to, to run its course, rises from one end of the heavens and sits at the other, and Father, we thank you that we can be enjoying that, especially this last week. And we thank you for, for today, for, for Easter, not just celebrating with, with families and not just being thankful for, for safe travels for loved ones, although we are, but Father, remembering the, the resurrection of your Son and promises that we have. We think about new life and we think about babies. We thank you for the, the Lucink babies and being born safe and, and sound. We ask that you continue to care for, for Julie and the boys and, and bless them. And Father, as we think about Father, new life, we think about what it is that you do in our hearts. We think about work to be done. We think about, the J, about JFA going on a, a bus tour. And Father, the wonderful work that JFA does and has done for years and years and years and continues to do. We thank you for ministries like that and various ministries that are born out of this particular region of the country. We ask that you would bless them and their work. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparation for God's word, let's stand together to sing Abide With Me, the final three verses. Please turn to 2 Samuel 1. We're back into to David for until he becomes king. 2 Samuel 1, I'm going to read 17 to 27. What we're doing, just working our way through books of the Bible, it's called expository preaching. You let the text set the, the agenda for what you're going to study. 
Um, it's pretty much baked into our tradition. It's what Calvin did. And uh, as a Reformed church, it makes sense to follow the, the Master in such things. Second Samuel 1. 17 to 27. And David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan in order to this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, let the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, nor fields that yield a ho- offering for, of grain. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, the sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle, Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. And how the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. You might find it helpful to keep your Bible open before you. Um, when I'm listening to some people, I have it open. Other times, I, I don't. Sometimes I find it helpful, so I encourage you to keep it open, provided we what's in it. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, as we, we open your word, we ask that it would be an open book before us, Father, whether it helps us to pay attention now or not. There's, there's different people that learn different. Father, we ask that it would be an open book before us throughout the week. Father, if this is our only, only dose of it, Father, two strong hits is not going to be enough for a week. Father, we're to be those who have our minds conform more and more to the image of your Son. It doesn't really take any special training to do that, Father. It's a matter of the heart. So we ask, Father, that we would have very soft hearts, very open to your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In 1997, 1997, there was two because two people had died. And their, their life and their death was memorialized in song. Now, both songs were, were reworkings of, of earlier pop songs, but into the form of lament. Now, the first song spawned uh, its music phenomenon that made, made millions. That was the number three song that year. The second song became the best-selling single since the charts began, they think that only White Christmas was, was a bigger song, and that's just before the charts began. So laments resonate. What we're going to think about tonight resonates. Just for, for fun, we'll see. I think back to 1997, I'd be surprised. Maybe some of us might be able to get both of these deaths that spawn these huge hits. But almost Everybody over the age of, say, 15 in here probably knows one of these people that died in 1997, and I'm going to choose a piece of candy here to figure out if anybody can remember who it was, either of these, you will get not one, not, well, you will get two Sour Patch Straws, but if you get both people, you'll get five, all right, so, I mean, it's, it's Easter, we're going all out today, can anybody, Mike, Diana Candle in the Wind, best-selling single of all time, of all time. There we go. Now the other one. No, she did not. But that was a, that was true. That was a big year. Actually, the notorious B.I.G. rapper Chris Wallace. 
not as much of a moral paragon by any stretch, by any stretch of the imagination, as Mother Teresa. But first lament was, as I just mentioned, I'll be missing you. It was a reworking of the police. Every breath you take, I just read that he still pays $5,000 a day still for the use of that song. Went to number three on the charts. It's for sing by Sean Combs about his friend Chris Wallace, who was shot on March 9, 1997. Life ain't always what it seems to be. Words can't express what you mean to me. Even though you're gone, we're still a team. Through your family, I'll fulfill your dreams. The second one, as Mike had mentioned, Candle in the Wind, 1997. About Princess Diana, who died in a car crash August 31, 1997, at the age of 36. I did not think she was that young. The older I get, 36 looks a lot younger. Sung by Diana's friend Elton John. Loveliness we lost, these empty days without your smile, this torch will always carry for our nation's golden child. And even though we try, the truth brings us to tears. All our words cannot express the joy you've brought us through the years. Number three, number one song that year were laments. What we're studying tonight, the reason they were so huge is not because most people personally Chris Wallace but it's because they've got people they lost and they love and they miss and what laments do is they give you words they give you emotional language emotional grammar to say how do I put this how do I get this out that's why those songs were hits. And that's what tonight's passage is about. I, I submit to you that this poem is useful as a model for public grief among us. One Bible teacher put it, we have nearly lost our capacity for such grief. Um, studies show that usually kind of the idea of how long somebody should kind of go before they kind of move their grief. Studies show that people generally give others about a month or two. Now, if you're in grief, you know you need way more than a month or two. But that's generally how it goes. Well, kind of, kind of get on, move on with your life a month or two later. And that, that's not how the Bible sees it. The Bible gives us all sorts of language to deal with grief because God invites us to grieve. And that's the claim of this sermon. God invites us to grieve. We see this first, begin to see grief in our first point, a time for lament. So when we last left David and Amalekite, one of the enemies of God's people, had brought news about Saul's death to David, thinking, hey, this guy's going to be totally excited. Hey, you, you can just take the king, just take the crown. He's thinking he's rewarded. This man does not understand David. He thinks David's like him. David's not like him. David's a man of, of passion. He's splendid in battle. He's exceedingly kind to the weak, eager to forgive. And now we see another aspect of his glory, which is grief. It's amazingly glorious to watch a godly person grieve. Doesn't mean it's always pretty, doesn't mean it's always easy. But there's a combination of a being both honest and reverent all at the same time, even through tears and cries and yelling. You see that in Job. You see it even more so in Jesus. We see it in David here, but Jesus, he's the best. He sees his own capital city and he breaks into tears. He's righteously indignant when life's not the way it's supposed to be for other people. He, he's a man of passion, and here we see David's a man of passion. He gets it out. That's what the author of Lamentation does. He gets it out. Counselors will still encourage that. Usually within the first few things, they'll say, how do I recover from this? Get it on paper. Write it out. And that's what David's doing. And he likely spent a lot of time on this lament, now, there's no reason to think that things in the Bible were just kind of written as a, as a draft. 
In a lament, says Dale Ralph Davis, words are carefully selected, crafted, honed to express loss as closely yet fully as possible. That's what's going on in verse 17 as David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. This is an extraordinary, beautifully, beautiful written poem. In the Hebrew, it's hard to see it in the English, but that, that's what you expect when you... Uh, maybe you, some of you have spoken... Like, like a eulogy at, at somebody's passing, maybe for a mother or a grandfather. All right, how many times did you go over those words over and over and over and over again? You do them because you want the words to be perfect. You want them to reflect your care for this person. You, you want to say, this is a show of love. I want to get it right for grandpa and for dad. I remember Mike. I remember your Mike. I remember Mike's brother playing the harmonica at Mike's dad's funeral. Like those things, are they're perfect. It's expression of your grief, and that's what's going on here. That's what David's trying to do, and he wants other people to to know this lament, um, just like people knew those two hit songs. He ordered that the men of Je Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It's written in the book of Jashar, as verse eighteen puts it. So David feels compelled. Interpret the events. That's what, that's what leaders do. They help interpret life. That's what parents do for their children. You help interpret life. That's what presidents at their best do. Think about Lincoln with Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And now we're engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. All Lincoln's doing there is saying, let me help you understand what's going on with all these deaths. And that's what David's doing. In the Spirit of God, he's still leading. What God does in his word, what you do in preaching, what you do in Bible studies, you're saying, okay, help me understand life. David, he begins to understand life by glorifying Saul and this man who tried to kill him numerous occasions. He begins the poem referring to the king saying, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on the heights. So he starts by calling him your glory. You see how cynical we are about fact that we can't even read the words how the mighty have fallen without cynicism. All right, David, he's totally sincere in this. But that tells you what a different day and age we live in and that they're not any more blind to their leader's faults than we are, especially David. Saul, so he's Israel's first king. So it's hard for us to, to know what a big deal that, that was. to, Just like it's hard for us to know why the Candle in the Wind song, although a beautiful song, was such a huge hit in Britain. Because, well, Diana wasn't our princess. And why it's hard for other people to understand why the death of your own father means everything it means to you, because you're the one who suffered the loss. Grief always has a very personal element to it, so the nation's grieving for their king, their glory, this word for glory, it also means a gazelle. So this word picture of Saul lying dead on the heights is one of a majestic buck lying dead in a place of prominence and seeming protection, as Bergen put it. Um, what David wants is when you think about Saul's death, he wants a very similar experience to when you watch Bambi and you see what happens to Bambi's mom. And you say, no, 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 oh, no, that's the response. You beg for it not to happen even as it's happening. And that's how it goes with death. Not something to celebrate, and that's what David is saying. With tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the Phil uncircumcised rejoice, as verse 20 put it. That the, these are Philistine cities standing for the whole country of, of Philistia. It's as if, okay, think about JFK. A lot of difficulties between JFK and the Soviet Union. It's as if somebody's saying after JFK is assassinated, you know what, don't be gloating in Moscow. All right, in St. Petersburg, you just kind of keep your mouths shut about this. We don't want to hear your thoughts on JFK. 
That's what's going on here. And David, of course, he knows he can't stop them from gloating over Saul's death because they've already stripped his body, cut off his head, and they hung his naked body up on a city wall. He's not going to stop them. But what he's saying is it's disgraceful to gloat over that. I mean, he's already shown his disgrace by the way he treated the Amalekite who thought he was going to get rewarded by telling him about it. Like the way that we respond to news about other people says a lot about us. The way I respond to news about others says something about me. The way you respond to news about others says something about you. And David thought that the death of this king, such horrible news that the place where it happened should be cursed. He says, O mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, nor fields that yield offerings of grain. Now, this is the same reason that people who have had a child die in a hospital do not want to visit that hospital. All right, well, we'll just use a different hospital. That's, that, that's the same reason why. We, we have a national monument at Gap. Places have, have emotional connections. So the ancients, they're not different from you or from me. They, they've got emotions, and we see that they had emotions, that it's only now, knee-deep into this psalm, that David even says the name of Saul. And he says it in such a way where it's like he can't even bring himself to say it. That's right. The shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. He can't even really talk about Saul yet by name, so he talks about the shield of Saul. It's, he's kind of talking around Saul, and we do that. All right, after, some, for some people, after their mother passes away, they don't they don't mom for a while, they just say her. They, they can't directly talk about the person yet, they, they just talk around them because it's just too painful. That's what's going on here with David. That's why often when people pass away, loved ones they turn their pictures around just for a little while. Just too much to see them. David started talking about Saul by way of the shield, and now he talks about David and Jonathan by way of their weapons, because he remembers what, what's good about them, what they did well. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Now, what we tend to admire, we remember what we admire in people that pass. Right? That's why in eulogies and even obituaries, it's things like he could fix anything. She should have been a professional chef. Those things are in there because we want to speak well. David remembers what Jonathan and David did well. And what, one thing he remembers is that for 40 years, Saul kept this place relatively safe. And that's appreciated. So David honors what's good in the king. And in our culture, we generally fail to, to do that with a, with a leader, with a king. Right? We, we tend to overlook what, what Bill Clinton did well. Because of his obvious faults, we tend to overlook what Donald Trump did well because of his obvious faults. And then what's more telling is we as a culture, we find a, find a way to dismiss a perfect leader. That's what you see with people dismissing Jesus. It's not just, you know, I'm not a religious person. It's a sense of, no, I see what perfection in a leader looks like with Jesus. And I'd rather not be governed by that. We want a heart like David that can give honor where honor is due. We see the way forward in our second point, which is appreciating Saul and Jonathan. David remembered what was best about the king and the prince. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. So David, he chooses about Saul now that Saul's dead. That's, that's a choice. That's a choice people often struggle with. Maybe you struggle with, it with things with your dad or things with your mom or sometimes for people even things with a spouse. But 
David, he remembers what's best in Saul, and so he tells the, the women of Israel to weep. He says, O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. David wants these same women who used to dance for Saul, saying, Saul has, say, Saul has slain his thousands, to weep because their protector and their caretaker is dead. And these women had benefited from Saul's reign. It's not like it was in the days of the judges anymore. When everybody did what was right in their own eyes, it's a little better in some ways because of Saul. And David wants the people to recognize, think about that life's a little bit better now that Saul, because Saul was here. That's the sort of respect that the Bible holds out for those in political governance, even despite their faults. And as we think about our day and age, it's pretty hard to square that with, with let's go Brandon. I mean, isn't it? It's pretty hard to square that with that. When you think about David, who had tried to be killed numerous times by Saul. All right, so whether you have any love loss for this president or the last one, They haven't done to you what Saul tried to do to David. We live in an age that could learn a lot from David. I live in an age that can learn a lot from David. I could learn a lot from David. The daughters of Israel, weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. And now David turns his attention from the king to his, his, his best friend, Jonathan. Verse 25, how the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan. You were very dear to me. Your love was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. David thought the world of David was amazed by his friends, and that is a good place to be in, to find be remarkably amazing people. Jonathan's life was a cause for amazement, as a Bible teacher put it. He's a moral marvel, sorry, a moral marvel. What you get with David is there's a sense of, why do you care about And my guess is, I hope, there's people in your life that you can't explain. Where they're morally, or their virtues are such where you can't say, okay, where the, why, why would she do that? That's a good situation to be in where somebody is that virtuous where it's like, I don't get how they're even here. I don't get how they even exist in this world. Those are gifts from God. And they're to be taken as gifts from God. So the more you got, the more grateful you should be. And we also have to thank God for good friends. That's what's going on with your love for me was wonderful, more lo- wonderful than that of women. And now, given the times we live in, it's inevitable that... Somebody's going to read this in terms of same-sex romantic relationships. Like, that's just totally inevitable that that's going to happen. And, of course, it has. Um, I think Bergen is right when he explains what this means. He says, for Jonathan, David was a peer, a friend, and a confidant that, that no wife could have ever been in that society. And his untimely death left a gaping hole in David's soul. When you read the David and Jonathan story, you see two guys where it's like, okay, we've, we've got the same passions. We've got the same values. We we're willing to fight for the same things. And now one of them's gone. Just gone. And David's saying, I don't know what can fill that. And so he tells God, I don't know what can fill that. So now when we assume that true friendship between guys, and this, this, is, this is true, guys have less, fewer, and fewer and fewer guys have friends that they could actually tell things to in the couple. Just, that's just statistically the case. But we now live in a point where it's which any actual friendship between two guys is thought to this on? There we go. We've gotten to a point where we no longer apparently understand friendship. And we've gotten to a point where we no longer understand erotic love. 
which is, of course, where we're at as a culture. Uh, that's all that says is people wondering whether David and Jonathan were, were gay. It's just saying we've really gone that far, that we just can't see clearly anymore, that men don't really have friendships that could actually be seen as loving or being vulnerable with each other. Matthew Henry put it, the more we love, the more we grieve. You see a picture of that with Jesus. He's grieving for his friend Lazarus. He's about to resurrect him in just a little bit. But he's bawling his eyes out because he loves that guy. It's worth considering if you've got folks in your life that you bawl your eyes out if they were to die. The more you love, the more you grieve. Now, the best way, of course, not to grieve is just never to love. That's not, not a good way forward. And David ends his lament with a phrase he's used three times, and he says how the mighty have fallen. But with this, David, he's referring to David as Saul and Jonathan as mighty. Um, David's able to get his mind off himself and instead to focus with and for his community on the public reality of loss. So the idea here is David, who's going to be king and knows he's going to be king, is able to get his way even though he's doubtlessly probably thought many times, I'm going to be a better king than Saul. And say, I'm going to say all the good things I can say about Saul. I mean, it, but that's, that's regularly what we see in our leaders, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, I got totally tired of, of Joe Biden when he became president saying all the wonderful things he could say about Donald Trump. Oh, and just sickened by all, and Donald Trump, all the wonderful things about Barack Obama. No, David's, David's different. David is totally different. He's big-hearted. He's a lot like his descendant, only his descendant, Jesus, is, is far better. Come to me and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. You take my yoke upon you, and you learn from me. Why? Because I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, says Jesus. That's where you find rest for your soul. You go right to that leader. And that's a king, and he's a king who knows death firsthand. He's been through it. And as we see today, he defeated death even, even as he mourned it. That's also a king who's got more hit songs written about him than anybody who died in 1997 or any time after. That's worth your consideration. It's also part of your healing in a death-filled world. Let's go to God in prayer. And Father, we have a lot to learn from David, and of course we got more to learn from Jesus. It seems with David, Father, he, he would know he's got a lot to learn from Jesus. We see that in certain psalms about the Messiah. Father, we ask that more and more people might recognize, I've got a lot to learn from Jesus about life and about death. And Father, we ask this in your Son's name. Amen. The next song, the idea basically is it's God taking us through and through death. Hey, you can think about Marion Wallenberg. You can think about your own loved ones who have passed away. But think about yourself as well. As we sing together, Precious Lord, take my hand. Let's stand to sing.
thinking about our offering, let's go together to, to God for mid Sioux opportunity. And Father, we think about the work that springs out of this region of the country. Father, I would imagine it punches well above its weight for ways that it helps people. And Father, we think about mid Sioux opportunity and ask that our gifts and offerings given towards them might be a, a blessing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.